Okay, well, um, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for being here. Um, hi, um, at the penultimate uh, lecture of the Leo Beck Institute London's annual series. Um, this is my first um, talk since taking over as, as um, director, so I'm excited to be here. Uh, it is also the first event that we've had since the terrible events that have um, been unfolding uh, since the weekend in Israel uh, and Gaza. Um, and aside from like everyone else being uh, shocked and horrified at, 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 at what's been happening, um, there's very little I can say uh, in terms of comment other than that uh, uh, at the Institute, our thoughts are very much with um, the victims and uh, their families and friends. And um, we have a sister institute in um, in Jerusalem. Um, everyone there is thankfully okay, but you know everyone it seems has been affected in some way or knows somebody who, who was affected. So yeah, it's uh, it's very much you know I think uh, a topic that, that that needs to be addressed. But uh, I think our intention is to to carry on with our program. Um, the lecture series, the, the, the Leo Beck lecture series, is a long-standing collaboration with the German Historical Institute uh, London, and I'm delighted that Mikhail Scheich uh, is, is here today as a representative of that institute. Uh, Mikhail, I don't know if you wanted to say anything. Yes, um, good evening everyone, and I always want to welcome you very warmly on behalf of the German Historical Institute London. And I want to thank you for joining us tonight here in the room and um, online, especially at this time when the horrific attack by, by Hamas on Israel weighs heavily on all our minds. Um, I think we are still in a state of shock, and I personally also in a kind of state of despair, to be honest. But I think it's important in this political context that um, we it's more important than ever in a way that we discuss the topics that is at the heart of this lecture series um, and that we think more deeply about how Jews and Jewish life were portrayed in the past. I'm usually rather skeptical about what history can teach us, but I think in this case, um, it seems it seems uh, vital. Knowledge of the past seems to be vital um, for our understanding of the present. That's why I'm really um, grateful to Professor Daniel Megilov um, for accepting our invitation to come to London and to speak to us. Um, Joe will introduce him in a, in, a, in a second. But I'm also grateful to the LBI um, for collaborating with us on this lecture series and on a number of lecture series in the past. Um, I think the lectures have always been much needed spaces for intellectual engagement and debate. And without them, our work at the Institute would be also poorer. And this is also why I'm really delighted that our long established um, partnership will continue under the new leadership of the, of the LBI. Mm -hmm. And I want to welcome Dr. Joseph Cronin um, to his new role uh, as director, also on behalf of the Institute. As it happens, um, Joe Cronin is no stranger to the Institute. <laughs> Um, a few years ago, he worked with us on a project on Jewish um, refugees from Nazi Germany and India, um, a very exciting project, which maybe have, could have gone further, but uh, still it was a really good project. And so we are delighted to be able to resume this collaboration in a way on a, on a much um, bigger scale. So, and all of us, that seem to wish you all the best for your, for your directorship. And we are... We are looking forward to welcome you back at the Institute every now and then when you are going to chair the um, Leo Beck lectures, which hopefully will return to the Institute to our premises at Bloomsbury Square in next year. So um, thank you very much, everyone, and all the best to you and congratulations to you. So it's a hand back to you then. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mikhail, for the very um, kind words. Um, let me introduce uh, um, tonight's speaker, um, who's, who's, who's traveled all the way from the United States to be here. Daniel H. Magalow is professor of German 
in the Department of Modern Foreign Languages and Literatures at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where he's also an affiliated faculty member with the Fern and Manfred Steinfeld Program in Jewish Studies, the Cinema Studies Program in the Department of History. Uh, he earned his BA in Comparative Literature from Columbia University and his MA and PhD in German from Princeton University. He serves on the academic board of the Holocaust Educational Foundation of Northwestern University and was the Pearl Resnick Postdoctoral Fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in 2005-2006. With Helen Sinrai, Professor Magalo is co-editor-in-chief of the very prestigious journal Holocaust and Genocide Studies. He is teaching and research which have been supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Getty Foundation, the German Academic Exchange Service, and the University of Tennessee Humanities Center, center around photography and film, and their intersections with Holocaust studies, Weimar Germany, and post-war memory. Alongside many articles, book chapters, and reviews focusing on photography, film, and memorials, he is the author, co author, editor, or translator of the following books. Uh, in Her Father's Eyes, A Childhood Extinguished by the Holocaust, which was published by Rutgers University Press in 2008, Nazi Exploitation, exclamation mark, <laughs> The Nazi Image in Lowbrow Culture and Cinema co-edited with Elizabeth Bridges and Kristen T. van der Lucht, published by Continuum in 2011. The Photography of Crisis, the photo essays of Weimar Germany, published by the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania State University Press in 2012. Holocaust Representations in History, an introduction co-authored with Lisa Silverman, uh, first published by Bloom Tree in 2015 and uh, with a revised edition appearing in 2019. And yet it will be heard, a Polish rabbi's witness of the Shoah and, and survival, written by Leon Thorne, but edited by Daniel Magalo and Emmanuel Thorne and published by Rutgers University Press in 2018. Finally, his edition of the collected works of the German photographer Albert Renger Patch, titled The Absolute Realist, Albert Renger Patch's writings on photography, technology, and modernity, 1923 to 1967, is forthcoming with Getty Publications. But tonight, we are excited to hear Professor Magalo speak about cute Jews, photography, and Jewish regeneration. Uh, Professor Magalo? Thanks, so thank you. Uh, well, first and foremost, thank you all for coming out and thank you also to everyone in uh, Zoom land for attending virtually as well. Um, we uh, obviously do have a lot on our minds these days and um, I agree uh, that what we can do in these times is continue with our work to help people become more nuanced thinkers and able to navigate the um, uncertainties of the world. Uh, which I think is at the heart of a, a liberal arts education. Um, I would like to, to formally thank the Leo Beck Institute and the German Historical Institute for, this, uh, for bringing me over here. It is quite a trip, but uh, it's a real uh, honor to be able to, uh, to do so. So um, thank you. Um, I will at this point dive right in. In 1935, after the Nuremberg Laws deprived Jewish Germans of their civil rights and ushered in a new phase of systematic anti-Semitic discrimination. Jews across Germany debated whether to remain in or depart from the only country that many of them had ever known. A large number had already answered this question through their actions. In 1933 and 1934, roughly 100,000 Jewish Germans left the country and in 1935, another 35,000 emigrated, almost a third of them to mandatory Palestine. It was within this turbulent context that a remarkable photographic document was published in 1936, 
Jüdische Kinder in Eretz Israel, a photo book, Jewish children in Eretz Israel, a, a, a photo book. Jüdische Kinder in Eretz Israel was the last overtly Jewish themed photo book published in Germany before the Holocaust. It was a collaboration between two German Zionists, the pioneering photojournalist Nachum Gidal, known uh, as Tim Gidal, and the journalist and scholar Bertha Bad Strauss. Even within Germany's rich interwar culture of narrative photography, which included ubiquitous illustrated magazines, deluxe coffee table photo books, and high modernist photo essays, Yudisha Kinder in Eretz Israel still stands out for its idiosyncratic subject matter and format. The photo book consists simply of Bad Strauss's six page introduction, a single page of captions, and including its cover, 21 photographs by Tim Gidal of adorable doll-like young children in mandatory Palestine, many of them recent emigres from Germany. Each photograph in this slim spiral bound book is printed on one side of thick paper. The portraits accord with the journalistic conventions of so-called straight photography with their sharp focus candid feel and natural lighting. But aside from their documentary character, they also seek to persuade readers through their sentimentality, as we see in these representative photographs. This first image is of a young girl with soft dark eyes, bobbed hair, and a gentle smile. This caption reads, Ava's parents came to Jerusalem in 1935 from Germany. Ava already speaks Hebrew as well as German. And in this second image, which is captioned, Misha, formerly Merkel, came from Berlin to Tel Aviv. Uh, in it, we see a chubby-cheeked, smiling young boy whose baby teeth protrude from his beaming smile. These children left Germany with their parents for mandatory Palestine, where they now appear to be happy, healthy, and thriving. Endearing photographs like these make it tempting to dismiss Yudisha Kinder in Eretz Israel as syrupy kitsch, or schmaltz, as one would say in Yiddish. And indeed, this photo book has attracted only minimal scholarly attention. One of the few photo historians to analyze the work at length, Patrick Rösler, reads Yudisha Kinda and Everest Israel as visual evidence of what he terms an unholy alliance between Zionists and national socialists at a historical juncture when their propaganda in interests coincided. Rösler argues that by 1936, the Nazis wanted Jews to leave Germany and Zionists were only too willing to oblige. As a text that promoted emigration, Kressler argues, Yudisha Kinder and Eretz Israel thus explicitly served the needs of Jewish Germans and implicitly benefited their persecutors. This argument, <laughs> this argument that this photo book benefited both Zionists and German anti-Semites is certainly plausible. And it also applies to many of the handful of Palestine-themed photo books published in Germany dating back to at least the mid-1920s. One of these Palestine-themed photo books was Karl Gerber's Palestina, Arabian, and Syrian Baukunstlandschaft und Volksleben, which appeared in an English edition as Picturesque Palestine, Arabia, and Syria, the Country, the People, and the Landscape. A second of these Palestine-themed books was Ludwig Preis and Paul Horbach's Palestina und das Ostjordanland. This richly illustrated book contained over 200 photographs, including 21 color images, which were quite a novelty at the time. A third Palestine-themed photo book from 1925 was Georg Landauer's Palestina, which was republished in a smaller edition in 1935. And to these three books, one can add a fourth. Arthur Rundt and Hans Kasparius's 1934 title, Das Palestina Bilderbuch, a set of 96 photographs with captions in German, English, Polish, and Hebrew. These Palestine-themed photo books all reinforced prominent Zionist themes to an audience in Germany, but they did so in new ways. Historian Rebecca Grossman convincingly reads photo books like these as attempts to understand and represent Zionism and the growing Jewish presence in mandatory Palestine using the new visual language of photography. Photography had been flourishing in Germany since the mid-1920s, particularly with the introduction of handheld Leica single-lens reflex cameras and printing techniques that made photographically illustrated books and periodicals financially viable. Notably, these titles focus on sacred geographies, sublime landscapes, and historic structures. But none highlights children. 
as conspicuously as Yudisha Kinder in Empath Israel. So we are left with the question why it uses this particular subject matter. We find one possible explanation for Gidal's aesthetic strategy in scholarship about the visual culture of Zionist youth movements. The historian Ulrika Pilarczyk has shown how photographs taken in the 1930s, 40s, and beyond of adolescent Halutzin, the immigrants to Israel's uh, to Israeli agricultural settlements, helped establish a collective memory rooted in powerful Zionist ideals of Jewish community. Yet examples of this officially sanctioned Zionist visual culture, such as these images from the 1930s of young agricultural laborers, more often accord with the aesthetic conventions of a more muscular Judaism. We find a similar articulation of this masculinized Zionist aesthetic in film, as for example, uh, in Hel Marlerski's 1935 documentary Avodah work, which also promotes an image of Jewish settlers that replaces the cliches of the weak, overly intellectual ghetto Jew with images of powerful, determined, and active manual laborers. As historian Ofer Ashkenazi has compellingly written, Lersky's entire film, quote, reveals muscular Jewish male bodies in laborious motion, end quote. The obvious thematic differences between these officially sanctioned Zionist films and photographs in Yudisha Kinder in Eretz Israel are thus quite conspicuous. They invite several key questions about this photo book. How does its deployment of photographs of cute children who are decidedly not muscular and decidedly not at work accord with this project of envisioning mandatory Palestine as the space of a Jewish future? Was it simply the case in 1936 that aesthetic strategies beyond depictions of muscular Jews were perceived as necessary to convince those Jews still in Germany to depart for the Middle East? In this talk, I argue that the answer to this question is yes. I read the 21 images of children in Yiddish Kinder in Eretz Israel as a form of soft propaganda that continues longstanding representational protocols of Holy Land photography and Jewish ethnography of the sort published by Preis, Reber Landauer, Hund, and Kasparius in the photo books I showed previously. This emphasis comes through powerfully uh, in, in the depictions in Yiddish Kinder in Eretz Israel of desert landscapes and iconic structures as well as its subtle allusions to anti-Semitism in Europe. Yet Gedal and Bad Strauss's photo book also departs radically from these conventions when it synthesizes received aesthetic traditions with a new aesthetic oriented around cuteness to produce in its readers in Germany an affective connection to the Zionist project. By the 1930s, Holy Land photography had long been framed almost exclusively through the sorts of aesthetic categories that literary scholar Sian Nai terms prestigious aesthetic categories, many of which are derived from painting. These categories include familiar ones used to, character, used to characterize aesthetic judgments, such as the beautiful, the sublime, the picturesque, and the spectacular. And indeed, in photography's first century, photographs of the Holy Land frequently appealed to these aesthetic categories. We find illustrations of this grandiose aesthetic in popular representations of the Near East, such as these views from the beginning of the 20th century by Underwood and Underwood, a popular distributor of stereoscope images. In these and in other examples of early Holy Land photography, we see clear horizon lines and wide angle shots. The focus on large landscapes and iconic structures highlights the sense of grandeur and gravity and the small size of the people in the photographs minimizes their importance within the context of the Holy Land's majesty. As we can see here, other visual strategies include the foregrounding of empty spaces and the de-emphasizing of the presence of indigenous populations as ways to subtly envision mandatory Palestine as a tabula rasa for Zionist pioneers. In her 2012 book, Our Aesthetic Categories, Zany, Cute, Interesting, Sian Nai makes a convincing case for the political significance of minor or marginal aesthetic categories, especially those of her book's title, The Zany, The Interesting, and most relevant here, The Cute. Nai claims that these minor categories' very marginality is what makes them the, quote, best suited for grasping how aesthetic experience has been transformed by the hyper-commodified, information-saturated, and performance-driven conditions of late capitalism, end quote. 
she adds that, quote, the non-aesthetic properties associated with cuteness, smallness, compactness, formal simplicity, softness, or pliancy, thus call up a range of minor negative affects, helplessness, pitiful, pitifulness, and even despondency, end quote. As an example, Nye argues that the centrality of cuteness in post-World War II Japanese art and commodity culture owes much to this sense of helplessness, defeat, and catastrophe that was produced by Japan's loss in the war. The Japanese even have a term for this, for this aesthetic, kawaii, meaning lovely, lovable, cute, or adorable, and it manifests itself across a range of mass cultural products like Hello Kitty, Pokemon, manga, anime, and so forth. I would argue that in the context of mid-1930s Germany, the doll-like feminized children of Yudisha Kinder and Eretz Israel served an analogous function. That is, rather than frame the Holy Land in familiar aesthetic terms as the sublime space of biblical history and Jewish redemption, this photo book took a different tack. It represents Jewish German children and their plight in an explicitly sentimentalizing way. By emphasizing the cuteness of the children already in mandatory Palestine, it implicitly infantilizes Jews in Germany by creating an allegory of their vulnerability in the face of anti-Semitic persecution. Moreover, the photo book's approach was particularly necessary by the mid-1930s because of the gendered effects of anti-Semitic persecution. In her research on daily life in National Socialist Germany, historian Marian Kaplan has shown the extent to which traditional gender roles persisted even in extreme circumstances. Jewish men and women alike were wary of the quote-unquote domestication of males and activities such as cooking, cleaning, uh, child rearing and caring for the elderly or those too ill to emigrate remained the province of women. Thus, persuading German Jewish women to emigrate to mandatory Palestine through strategies that interpolated them not as muscular laborers, but as mothers, caregivers, and the keys to a Jewish future is central to the narrative and visual rhetoric of Yudisha Kindra and Abbots Israel. Furthermore, this photo book aims to establish positive, affective, and especially haptic relationships with the Holy Land. It encourages readers in Germany to embrace and love Zionism and a future Jewish state as they might dote on their own children, to figuratively pinch them on the cheek and praise them for having such a shame of time. In so doing, Vidal and Bad Strauss's photo book broadens the lexicon of Zionist photographic strategies beyond sweaty bodies and socialist collectives tilling the fields and or orchards. It posits a different Zionist aesthetic beyond the familiar visual tactics of a masculinized muscular Judaism. Despite its idiosyncratic subject matter, the turn to cuteness that we find in Yudisha Kinder and Eretz Israel is not entirely unprecedented. To the contrary, it continues a tradition of interwar German photo books about children and animals, many with explicitly many with an explicitly sentimental character. And I'll show you some in a bit. What sets Yudisha Kinder and Eretz Israel apart as a photo book, however, is how it maps this sentimentality and cuteness onto older Jewish photographic traditions and visual codes. So in the following, I will examine three photographic traditions and discourses to which Yudisha Kinda in Eretz Israel is heavily indebted in which it synthesizes into something entirely new. The first of these discourses is the early history of Holy Land photography. The second is early 20th century uh, Jewish photographic ethnography. And the third context is the aforementioned interwar German photo book genre about children and animals. As I provide some of this media historical context and background for Yudisha Kinder in Eretz Israel, I will return to the photo book and examine several uh, examples that show how it visualizes Zionist ideals of community, both by drawing on some aspects of these photographic traditions and by rejecting others. The first of these, these discourses, Holy Land photography, dates to photography's early decades in the mid 19th century. Then is now, one of the defining ideas underwriting ph photography's popularity was the belief that its unprecedented ability to render the natural world with a high degree of fidelity afforded it a unique status as a truth telling technology. 
For this reason, the camera became an important tool for religious propaganda. For instance, one of the earliest photographers of the Holy Land, the Englishman Francis Frith, published albums and illustrated Bibles that aimed to verify biblical narratives scientifically. Frith's photographs, like the ones uh, you see that were included in the album F. Frith's Photo Pictures of the Lands of the Bible, replicate the formal conventions of landscape painting and appeal to viewers' familiarity with the sublime, the picturesque, and other prestigious aesthetic categories that they would have recognized from landscape paintings. Other photographs, such as this deluxe photographically illustrated Bible in its image of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, helps help readers visualize sacred spaces. Writing about such depictions uh, from the late 1850s, photo historian Douglas Nickel argues that Frith conceived and offered the stereo views, lantern slideshows, and folio editions of his photographs of Egypt and Palestine as spectacle. Frith was uh, only one of many 19th and early 20th century photographers interested in making these kinds of images. Others such as Felix Salzmann, Maxime Ducombe, Felix Bonfils, Fred Francis Bedford, James McDonald, Arthur Rhodes, and many others also helped establish and popularize a set of photographic protocols for representing the Holy Land. Their images emphasize spaces of archeological, historical, and religious significance and typically downplay individuals. Photographs of holy sites, ruins, desolate desert landscapes, and seemingly timeless but often invisible ind indigenous inhabitants aim to evoke responses of awe and reverence from viewers abroad. These early traditions of Holy Land photography persisted into the 1920s and 30s, by which time printing photographs in mass market books instead of just kicking in the images had become technologically, uh, had made making photo books technologically and economically feasible. In interwar Germany, works like the Palestine themed photo books that I mentioned earlier found a receptive readership. However, by this time, they had taken on new functions beyond simply helping believers visualize the Holy Land and experience it vicariously. Against the backdrop of racialized anti-Semitism and the emergence of political and cultural Zionism, these Palestine photo books also functioned as a form of propaganda. In review of several of these, of these books that appeared in one of Berlin's leading newspapers, the Fossische Zeitung, in December of 1925, the reviewer Moritz Goldstein recognized how photography was helping make the Zionist dream comprehensible in ways that texts alone could not. Describing the photo books by Landauer and Kreis, Goldstein noted, quote, you don't just want to hear about Palestine, you also want to see it, end quote. To use Goldstein's words, these photographs made Palestine greifbar, which means graspable both figuratively and literally. If Jews in Germany could not visit the Holy Land, then photography could help bridge the gap by creating an affective and tactile connection, like the bond between mother and child. And indeed, from its very first image, Yudisha Kinder in Eretz Israel visualizes this longing for a haptic relationship with the Holy Land. Like many images in this photo book, this one explicitly foregrounds the act of touching or hugging and the comfort and safety associated with it. This photograph depicts a young girl with a young woman who is possibly her mother or older sister. His caption reads, Yola's, uh, quote, Yola's parents came to the country from Germany and Austria. They lived and died in Beit Alpha. That's where Yola was born and raised, end quote. The narrow cropping brings the young woman and girl closer together. Both smile and exude a sense of contentment, happy to have found a new home abroad. The photo book's second uh, image functions similarly. We learn from its caption that, like the first photograph, it also depicts settlers on a kibbutz. The mother came to Emek Harod through the auspices of a Berlin Zionist organization, and she happily clutches her child, who already goes by the Hebrew name Narit. Although settlers like the ones depicted in these first two photographs faced many hardships, those challenges are invisible in these images. In the early 1920s, Polish and Russian Zionists established these settlements, uh, Bet Alpha and En Harod, that both attracted, and both attracted young people, especially European students. Yet neither the images nor their captions 
even hinted the fact that both settlements are located near Mount Gilboa, an inhospitable malaria-infested terrain that even the Hebrew Bible describes as cursed. Instead, these photographs teem with connotations that Eretz Israel is the space where Jews fleeing Europe are warmly embraced, in this case, literally. While the photo book traditions that aim to help Europeans visualize, Holy Land, uh, visualize the Holy Land provide one crucial context for understanding how Gadal photographs space, a second important discourse, the practice of early 20th century Jewish ethnographic photography, helps us better understand how he represents the people. The most familiar examples of this type of photography are the products of expeditions to the ghettos and shtetls of Eastern Europe conducted by researchers and photographers, such as Alter Katzizna, Shloyma Rappaport, better known as S. Ansky, Menachem Kipnis, and perhaps most famously, Roman Vishniak. Sometimes funded by relief organizations, these projects became important ways to envision the unity of disparate Jewish populations and to mobilize Zionist sentiments amid rising anti-Semitism. Yet unlike the popular traditions of Holy Land photography, this photographic mode frequently, although by no means exclusively, emphasized sentimentality and pathos, particularly in images of school children or youths. The reason is that some of these projects, most famously Roman Vishniaks, were funded by Jewish relief agencies for whom images of destitute Jews were useful fundraising tools. As Samuel Spinner has convincingly argued in his recent book, Jewish Primitivism, Ethnographic projects like these by Jews, many of them living outside of Europe, often constructed Eastern European Jews as savage and primitive. Spinner cites Franz Kafka's image of Yiddish-speaking Jews with their superstitions, circle dances, and repetitive chanting as presenting, quote, an exciting repudiation of a hollowed-out westernized Judaism, end quote, and a locating of the authentic. Um, Spinner adds that this image of Jews from an anthropological past functioned as a, quote, critique of modernity activated by the positive evaluation of a purportedly pre-modern society, end quote. Photographs from these expeditions to the provincial backwaters of Jewish Eastern Europe gave visual form to this critique, which Spinner terms Jewish primitivism. One example of such a primitivizing ethnographic project was undertaken by Shloyma Rappaport, the author of the play, The Dybbuk, who was better known by his pseudonym, S. Ansky. S. Ansky and his colleagues traveled through Bohemia and Poldolia between 1912 and 1914 to collect and record folklore, including oral histories, songs, customs, ceremonies, and superstitions. And notably, they also took over 2,000 photographs that show rich traditions of Ashkenazi Jewish community and culture, but also the oppressive material conditions of the Pale of Settlement. In these photographs, for instance, uh, we see two, uh, two images of children playing. Should I advance this here? No, I think I went too far. All right, two images of, of children playing. The one on the left is a slice of life scene of children during recess at the Cheder, the traditional religious elementary school. The photograph on the right depicts children clustered together next to a dilapidated building in Kremenets, which is now in Ukraine. Such ethnographic inventories by Esansky, as well as those by Katsizna and Vishniak and others, have become defining moments in the visual aesthetic of modern Jewry. In no small measure, these photographs' rhetorical power arises from their retroactive value in framing the fate of the Jews depicted. We, of course, know what they didn't, which makes their fate in these images all the more tragic. Books and exhibitions regularly package photographs like these with catastrophic, doom-filled, and backshadowed language. The title of a 1999 collection of Roman Vishniak's photographs uh, of children typifies this approach. They are the Children of a Vanished World, a play on Vishniak's 1977 book, A Vanished World. Jeffrey Chandler has aptly characterized this photographic aesthetic with its sense of loss and impending doom as taking place in what he terms, quote, the time of Vishniak, end quote. The photographs resonate powerfully with received imaginings of authentic Jewish culture, Jewish culture but also the grinding poverty and pogroms of the shtetls. But insofar as Vishniak was photographed in 1935 on behalf of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which had hired him to take pictures, 
that could be used for fundraising, Vishniak had a strong incentive to seek out photographic subjects that he could use to accentuate Eastern European Jews' traditional religiosity, poverty, pathos, and desperation. As a photo book about Jewish people in Jewish spaces, Yudisha Kinder in Eretz Israel echoes this practice of photographing Jews in indigenous uh, spaces, even as it repurposes them for a new Jewish space in a new era. For instance, in the book's sixth photograph, in the book's sixth photograph, we see a toddler in a space that is decidedly less oppressive than the shtetl. The landscape may be rocky, but the buildings are sturdy and modern with plentiful natural light. As we read in the caption, the settlement provides the young boy named Reuben, and implicitly other Jews as well, with enormous possibilities for discovery. But alongside the traditions of Holy Land photography and early 20th century Jewish ethnography, Yudisha Kinder in Eretz Israel also draws on a third, very different photographic discourse that was especially popular in interwar Germany, namely the genre of photo books about cute children and animals. As photo historian Roland Jaeger has argued, juvenile themed photo books that had diverse manifestations in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s. Representative works about children and animals included several titles by Hede Walter, who, like Tim Vidal, worked as a photojournalist for popular illustrated magazines. Walter's 1930 work, Mutter und Kind, Mother and Child, is one representative title. And she also collaborated on several books with the novelist Paul Iper. With their many images of cute children and anthropomorphized young animals, these works reinforce ideologies of childhood innocence and purity. The genre of child and juvenile themed photo books also included a wide range of politically themed works, including both folkish and explicitly fascist works, as well as leftist publications. On the political right, we find examples such as Unsere Deutsche Kinder, Our German Children, a 1930 book, a 1932 photo book by Anna Lent by Dierksen, whose series of physiognomic photo books, Das Deutsche Volksgesicht, translated often as the face of the German race, fetishized Aryan types found in Germany and elsewhere in Northern Europe. Another example is the 1934 work Jugend und Hitler, 120 Dokumente aus der Umgebung des Führers. Youth Around Hitler, 120 picture documents from the environment around the Fuhrer. This book, like many other Hitler-themed photo books by the Nazi leader's personal photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann, cultivated the mythology of Hitler as a caring, friendly, and avuncular leader who had a particular fondness for children and animals. On the other side of the political spectrum, we find works like Andreas Geick's 1929 photo book, Die Rote Kinderrepublik, ein Buch von Arbeiterkindern für Arbeiterkinder. The Red Children's Republic, a book by and for children of the workers. Funded by the German Social Democratic Party, this child-themed photo book incorporated avant-garde photographic techniques such as photo montage in the service of a leftist pacifist message. And finally, alongside these explicitly political photo books, there also appeared in interwar Germany ostensibly a political work, so I'm skeptical of that, such as Lotte Herrlich's 1924 narrative of her son's development, Rolf, ein Lied vom Werden in 30 Naturaktaufnahmen, Rolf, a song of becoming in 30 uh, natural nudes, uh, or her 1926 project, Geliebte Leutchen, beloved diminutive people. Um, but whatever their political and cultural commitments, these child-themed photo books were all part of the interwar boom in the photo book trade, which made images of cute children objects for mass consumption in Germany by Jews and non-Jews alike. The photographic discourses of Holy Land photography, Jewish ethnography, and juvenile-themed photo books are the three key traditions, or at least three of the key traditions, there are probably more, that converge in Yudisha Kinder in Eretz Israel. Yet they do not coexist comfortably. In fact, Bertha Bad Strauss's introduction states explicitly that the photo book rejects the traditions of sublime biblical landscapes and pathos eliciting ethnography, even if the work is very clearly informed by them. 
her introduction teems with references to Theodor Hatzel in his famous oxymoronic adjective Alt Neu from his utopian novel Alt Neuland, Old New Land of 1902, which imagined mandatory Palestine as the space of a modern cosmopolitan Jewish society. And at the same time, Bad Strauss's introduction uses truisms and diminutive filled anecdotes to encourage readers to see the photographs of cute children whose backgrounds might resemble their own as the hope for this old new Zionist future. Bad Strauss begins by narr narrating the origin story for the book, which supposedly arose out of Tim Gidal's encounter with the young Sephardic Jew who appears on the cover. Gidal was, according to the story, sitting in his Tel Aviv apartment wondering, quote, how do I show the true Palestine to the people out there? This harsh and meager land with the bare mountains and fields scarce in greenery, this land that is unique in spite of everything, unquote. We then read in Bad Strauss's introduction that at that very moment, Masal, the daughter of the corner vegetable dealer, knocked on the door to ask if Gidal wanted to buy any oranges or chatzilim. Describing the little girl with her happy black eyes, prominent white teeth, and sun hat, as you see here on the cover, Bad Strauss continues, quote, and when the photographer saw little Masal, you all can surely empathize with him. Then he knew. It wasn't the mountains or the fields and not even the old walls and the deep seas that give this old new land its unique imprint. It's the children, end quote. She adds that if one can successfully represent the image of the children of Palestine, then one can create an image of the land that no travel guide can offer, because in Bad Strauss's words, quote, Den dies ist das Land der Kinder, for this is the land of children. But even as Yudisha Kinder in Eretz Israel explicitly disavows photographic precedence and presents itself as a book that is looking for a new photographic idiom through which to represent a Jewish future, it, never, it nevertheless remains beholden to these photographic and aesthetic traditions. Many of the photographs still resonate loudly with the formal and thematic leitmotifs of Holy Land photography, Jewish ethnography, and Germany's culture of child-themed photo books. The contest between photographic discourses of the sublime, the beautiful, and the objective on the one hand, and those of the cute, the sentimental, and the subjective on the other, manifests itself in a tension between the matter-of-fact captions to the photos and Bad Strauss's sentimentalizing, affect-eliciting descriptions of the same photographs in her introduction. For instance, photograph 11 is simply captioned, Blick auf die Herzlstrasse in Haifa, a view onto Herzl Street in Haifa. It evokes the ro romantic tradition of beholding sublime landscapes, think Caspar David Friedrich's wanderer above the sea of fog. But where Gidal's photograph puts readers in a subject position similar to the one occupied by the child viewing the cityscape and its Bauhaus architecture, Bad Strauss's introduction emphasizes the image's cuteness, not its modernity. She writes in her introduction, quote, here, one of the children peeks out over the balcony into the distant hills on the horizon. Perhaps she's looking out for a friend, quote. The caption suggests that the image primarily concerns a child searching for a playmate, like Jews looking for community and belonging that they could not find in Germany in 1936. Other examples of children in villages um, or kibbutzim evoke the ethnographic imagery of Anski Katsizna in Vishnia. Like images by these ethnographers, Gidal's photograph in his purely descriptive caption on the village street of Bet Alpha shows Jews in situ uh, in a small locality. Bad Strauss, however, transforms the children into reenactors of, of Bible stories when her introduction describes them as Adam und Eva, noch einmal erschaffen, Adam and Eve created anew. Similarly, where Gidal's caption uh, Dan from Givat Brenner, his parents uh, came from Italy. Um, Gidal's caption characterizes the boy's family as immigrants, presumably uh, Zionists and kibbutzniks. Bad Strauss instead stresses the boy's cuteness and writes, quote, whether the parents come from Italy, as in image number 12, or Russia, there's no difference. We always find in their beaming eyes the same passion for living and the boundless curiosity for all the new things unfolding around them." 
I'll conclude this talk by examining the final image of Yudisha Kinder in Eretz Israel, because the final units of narratives, whether written or photographic, tend to carry added interpretive significance. The final photograph's significance is conspicuous given the photograph's diminutive size. Like the image of the girl looking onto Herzl Street in Haifa, the photo, this photograph's caption, Amstran von Tel Aviv, on the beach in Tel Aviv, is strictly denotative, even as it again evokes the affect-laden romantic trope of gazing into the distance. In her introduction, Bad Strauss latches on to this symbolism. She writes, uh, and I'm translating here, quote, the, the tiny child's body before the infinity of the sea. This is one of the most gripping and thought-provoking images in this colorful series, end quote. This final image makes the project of Yudhisha Kinder in Eretz Israel explicit. One cannot see the child's face, and, and German Jewish readers across the ocean are her implied conversation partners. Only by emigrating to mandatory Palestine can this child become visible. Only the completion of the Zionist project will make it possible to see and touch this cute Jew has already left Germany for what she and her family hope are a brighter future. Thank you. We so much time for um, a really rich and fascinating talk. Uh, it raises so many questions and not so many themes. Um, I take it you're happy to take, take of course. questions. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, we've got um, people on Zoom as well, and I've been asked that if you would like to ask a question. Uh, and you're and you're joining online. Please write your name in the chat, and then we can we can call on you to. Um, I don't know why I talk to the in person audience. So we can call on you to. Uh, Welcome to my world, right? <laughs> so, but um, also, um, there are questions from the room as well. Please. Uh Oh, yeah. Yes, okay. go ahead. Right. <laughs> so thank you for this. Um, yeah, it's really fascinating talk. Really, um, that really interrogates a lot of the issues with this work. But it might seem really ephemeral. Um, I was really, I was really thinking about the fact that it seems like a lot of the children in these images are, are refugees. And um, there were two things I was thinking about that might sort of raise the stakes of that a bit. Um, and so I guess the first, and maybe make some sort of argument um, in that way as well for the significance of their cuteness. Um, one thing I was thinking about is that there's, maybe that, like, that cuteness serves some sort of evolutionary aspect that when parents are dealing with a like squealing, difficult child, the fact that they're cute means they don't raise, they don't send that child off to the wolves or something like that. Um, so the idea that maybe, in, I guess speaking in the terms of this book, that maybe the fact that these children are cute is also in a certain sense a, um, I guess a sense of a, sorry, this is, this is probably, um, the, the fact that it's in 1936, yeah. we have this, this yeah, knowledge yeah, of what yeah. comes, but in a certain sense, a justification of their presence or survival. Like, they're so cute. You don't want anything that's happened to them. Um, aren't they great? And, uh, and also just in general, the, the significance of children, um, I think of it generally in terms of the work that I've done in teaching literature about the Holocaust, yeah. where children are often really, um, it's really, Relatable or um, good uh, characters to have in these sort of the, the children who are sympathetic towards children, and it's a lot easier to um, have a sense of solidarity with them. So I was just thinking, in, in terms of the, in terms of these children being um, being refugees, and some sort of question about how they're received in Germany, whether the fact of their cuteness um, or the fact of their, their being children might, in some ways, be making an argument uh, for readers in Germany about uh, about their own validity yeah. their, and the, their own significance. Yeah, I mean, I, these are all these are 
very, very important points. I, I think the, the, the way I understand the way this book is deploying cuteness is that by this time, a large number of the people who would want to leave and who were able to leave mm -hmm. had done so. Obviously, not everybody. Um, and as as I mentioned, you know, there was a very gendered dimension to this, right? A lot of a lot of you know, more women remaining uh, than you know, sort of young young pioneers. And so that this this book is understanding itself or is, or is acknowledging this kind of demographic imbalance that you know with given when it came out like i'm not sure this book could have come out and had the same resonance if it had come out you know just two or three years earlier because it's very much targeting the remaining jews in germany who were disproportionately still women um, who were there because many you know, caregivers, like because of the gender, you know, effects of of anti-Semitic discrimination. So, you know, in that regard, it's it, in that regard, it's sort of you know targeted marketing, like in a, in sort of you know nineteen thirty six version of that. That you know rather than um, try to just sort of show another version of the same, you know, oiled, sweaty bodies, you know, tilling the soil. Um, that is that is a different, you know, a different approach toward that. Um, and, you know, pr particularly since since Freud, the, the rhetoric of, you know, childhood innocence and purity and, you know, uh, you know, that, that, that idea is very strong in spite of Freud saying, you know, kids have lots of sexy thoughts and they're, you know, not as, not as pure, you know, as we think, but like, you know, th that, I think that's the kind of mythology, um, you know, the sort of chubby cheeked cherub of you know of Renaissance painting that is that is uh, still you know very much in, in play here um, and that um, th this photo book is is replicating. So um, I mean you, you touched on a lot of a lot of things in, in your in your question. I hope this addresses some of them. Um, Thank you. Other questions? David Blake. Um, great talk. A couple of questions. Um, First one I have for you is, what do you think happens to this culture, this German Jewish culture and the German culture making for the most about Palestine? Because of course, on the one hand, like it it dies literally, figuratively, of course. But I just wanted to zoom back and see, you know, something that's quite obvious I think for you, but maybe not for everybody, is how German Jewish that culture really was in the mm -hmm. um, You know, of course, there are. Jewish, great Jewish photographers who are not in the German speaking world, but it really is remarkable the extent to which this, this the Palestinian photo book culture is a German Jewish one. Mm -hmm. and of course, there then there are photo books later, but uh, not by uh, yeah. not by that same culture. But what I want to know your thoughts about what's going on there, um, and then I also wanted to, to to ask you what you make of the Yiddish Kinder book in terms of Gidel's later work specifically. Is playing these series of books called the Mai Village series, yeah, yeah. Um, which is totally fascinating for people who don't know. It's I don't know for I don't know for how many years he did this, but and I'm not sure how many. There's a, at least a dozen books where uh, he all travels the world, um, showing a village and village life and characters um, all around the world, kind of family of man in a photo book. Yeah, yeah. Over, you know. uh, so I'm just those are my. Yeah, yeah. I, well, on the first, on the first question, I mean, my impression is, I mean, I agree with you. You know, what happens to this this German Jewish photo book culture? It sort of literally and figuratively dies. But to the extent it doesn't die, I think it becomes a more of a Hebrew language um, photo book culture, um, which is to say, one that is, um, you know, beyond the purview of this talk, or perhaps more honestly, beyond the purview of my linguistic abilities. Um, you know, with the changes uh, in, uh, with the political changes, the establishment of an actual state of Israel, I think that pretty obviously changes everything because these kinds of books are not really necessary. I mean, for many reasons, these kinds of books aren't, aren't necessary. So, um, I mean, that would be my read on it. Like what happens to these books, they kind of migrate into, into Hebrew. I mean, and, you know, one analogy that, that I think of it, that's not really about photography, but is the um, bizarre situation at the Eichmann trial of all of these 
German Jewish lawyers talking to German Jewish judges in Hebrew, uh, even though they could have, you know, probably communicated more effectively and quicker in German. But again, part of the, this kind of translation um, or this, you know, um, immersion of of this culture into Hebrew. And so that's my impression of what what's happened with um, some of this photo book culture to the extent I've, I've you know, looked at a few titles uh, here and there, like Flora Bechich did, you know, some books, but those have gone from being in German and Yiddish into, into Hebrew. So, um, you know, a translation and an adaptation. That I guess that's what I say with that. Um, the the post-war series that Gidal and his, uh, I, I think it wasn't just Tim Gidal, I think it was Sonia Gidal as well. Him, him and his, right. his, <laughs> him, him and his uh, uh, spouse were, were doing, um, you know, it was a, a kind of trade publication photo book, um, you know, day in the life, day, you know, day in the village. Um, I think the I think the archives for those are in some very bizarre place like the University of Southern Mississippi or something. Like they're in some really strange kind of place in case you're interested in doing more work on those. I've looked at, I've looked at a few of those. Um, you know, I, there's certainly a genealogical connection, right, between Gidal's, you know, uh, Taking these kinds of photographs in this book, and then this kind of you know later you know later project that's um, you know, those are English language books, I believe. I don't know if they were translated. Maybe they were, but they were certainly targeting an American readership. I think first and foremost, and um, you know it, it, I think it speaks to the um, what to the endurance of this you know the appeal of cute kids of you know of cuteness right of of seeing. Um, you know, good-looking, adorable, huggable children, right? That that sell. I mean, it's a you know, it's a marketing thing again. So, um, yeah, I know. I mean, I don't have I don't have a you know, if if it didn't completely destroy the Zoom setup, I could pull up a cover of one of those books on my computer. But I, I think I will. I, I could show you later if you're interested. Um, but um, I, yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly a, a connection there. Please. Um, I've already been. Um... My thought there is that category of cuteness is the political and social, the masterful and natural evolutionary instinct. Absolutely. Yeah. It isn't inconsistent or constructed. It says very specific characteristics. I think it's wrong to say that evolutionary instinct in the same way that childhood is, um, and the significance of childhood is a 19th century construct. Childhood innocence existed. I think that childhood in the 18th century did not mean what it did in the context of domestic or the culture of domesticity in the 19th century. So both categories are a construct. Yeah, I mean, this and childhood. Yeah, this Very is. Weird. Absolutely. Well, this is evolutionary, but the masses also is natural. The, the argument in, in uh, is it Philippe Arié's Centuries of Childhood? I mean, this is his argument, and you know, the, of course, the example. Well, but, but I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think I think the example that's often brought up are these, you know, these uh, sort of early medieval depictions of, um, you know, uh, Mother Mary, and then you know, the baby Jesus, who's just like a small person, you know, doesn't have the kind of Childlike features, and just in, 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 you know, sometimes you'll see these sort of absurd early anatomical images of like little, you know, people, like rather than, uh, you know, so childhood as a kind of, you know, just small, like shrunken version rather than as something at a, a fundamentally different developmental, uh, developmental state. And um, yeah, I mean, as a, as a, you know, I suppose we could get into lengthy discussions of, of you know, aesthetic politics and the, you know, the, the constructedness of, of certain aesthetic categories but I, I certainly ag agree I mean I would I would understand cuteness in the in the terms of uh, Georg Lukacs who talked about second nature which was his term for the way that that um, capitalism um, finds ways of naturalizing things that are not natural um, to the to the point that they mask their own constructiveness in such that oh, indeed Luka, Georg Lukács, the, the Hungarian uh, literary critic, I could give you the, the title after the talk. Um, the, um, you know, I mean, this is, I think, a, a kind of uh, common refrain of, of um, certainly of Marxist criticism that, that aesthetics are, you know, used in, 
in deployment of certain political ends. Um, and as part of that, they naturalize themselves to, to seem non-constructed, eternal, ahistorical, um, and so forth. So fundamentally, I agree with what you're saying. So a few questions that come up in the chat. All right. Um, I think I'll read them. Like one and then you can answer them or several others. First is from Claire Weissenberg. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I'm struck by how similar <clears throat> many of the wartime slash post war images are to both as in the picture post and in the propaganda magazine uh, for Kitchener refugee camp, um, some victims of the Nazi terror. Can you point me to books about a wider body of photographs taken at this time? I'd love to that oh, that's a, that's a good question and a difficult one. Um, if if at this time means the the inner war period, I mean there is a there's a an absolutely amazing book that has an utterly bizarre and inscrutable title called Autopsy, as in autopsy, a history of German photo books from 1914 to 1945. Uh, who picked the main title? Not me. I don't know, but it's this. Uh, two volume lavishly illustrated set from Steidl, you know, the prestige German publisher that just does amazing books. That is, um, I mean, to me anyway, the kind of you know standard, gold standard of, of German photo book histories. And it's, you know, I think I got it as a birthday present. It was like 60 pounds. It's just, it's ginormous. Um, and it's based on um, the um, a Manfred Hiking collection, which is, I believe housed at the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. Um, so that's um, that. That would be the kind of uh, alpha and omega of uh, you know where to go for for more books about um, uh, interwar German photo books. I, I hope that I hope that answers the question. Although the um, all right, I'll I see a thank you in the chat. I'll take that as having having answered. Thank you, Claire, for your your question. Well, I um, Steve Weiss asks, thanks for this excellent talk. My question is about the word cute itself. In British English, it still feels a bit like a North American rival, perhaps, perhaps more so sweet. Does that have the same resonance? And what are the terms in general that might be used? Hmm. Interesting. Well, first of all, Sue, thank you for attending virtually. <laughs> um, I mean, I obviously I can't comment on whether, you know, as myself in North American, I can't comment on the uh, on whether cute has a kind of North American uh, specificity to it. I do think in German um, they would say what Zeus probably like sweet, um, needly. Yeah, I mean, and you know, in 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 German the way you say diminutive is a verniedlichung, which is sort of like. What a slightly negatively coded smallness or something, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean these are. I mean that's a that's a, a good question. I'd be curious what the etymology of, of cute is in this context. Probably something I should have should have uh, looked up rather than taking it as a a historical uh, category. Um, so. I don't know. I, I don't think I, I perceive they may be there, but I certainly haven't haven't perceived any differences between these categorizations that are so. I mean, there's obviously always a little bit of slippage culturally, um, you know, between um, cute and neatly or cute and sweet, or as um, uh, we were talking about at a workshop, you know, Yiddish toit and German toit, right? Even those aren't the same, right? That that these you know, translation is its own is its own thing, and there are these these kinds of slippages, each having its kind of um, cultural specificity to it, and its own traditions and, and genealogies. Um, I do think there's. I, I would, in the absence of doing additional research or having it on hand about you know the the, the differences and etymologies of these words, I would suspect that that while there may be some slippage between German and English, that it's still probably comparable. That's certainly one of the guiding assumptions of this presentation. Um, 
have the reason that he feels that the focus on getting small numbers of children within the book is intended to send a subliminal message that there was a new land that would stay yearning for an increased population. Hmm. Um, interesting, interesting question. Um, I mean, and I think, you know, I think the, the phrasing of the question sort of suggests an answer in a sense. I mean, I, I, I do think it, um, I do think, I do think it, it, by just having so few children there, there is the implication of, and we need more. Um, but at the same time, I, I think one of the, the strategies of this kind of photography, um, which I might even in an anachronistic way refer to as neoliberal, would be to focus on individuals as a way of um, avoiding talking about structures and, and larger political issues by um, recasting um, the, the, the Zionist project as one of individuality and as one of individual decisions and individual commitments rather than as something that, um, as we are tragically seeing uh, you know, this past week, involves larger structures, larger groups of people, and that isn't simply a matter of what individual people do or don't, don't want to do. So um, in that regard, I think um, the focus on individuals, the focus on, on singular children, the focus on small children is all part of it. It's, it's part of its rhetoric. It's part of its you know, persuasive technique um, that is like so many appeals to children somewhat emotionally manipulative. Um, you know, if we had 20 pictures of just, you know, non-children, ugly children even, like, you know, would that make them any less important, right? Would that make their lives any any less any less valuable? I mean, I think the answer is no, but, um, you know, who's going to buy a book called, you know, Ugly Jewish Kids in Palestine? <laughs> not, yeah, maybe Nazis, right? But, um, I don't know the numbers. Um, I know it, it was understandably very small. Um, the, the publisher was, let's see if I can, this is usually how you, how you uh, mess up your PowerPoint. Um, yeah, as you see, it was, you know, the, the Brandutsche Verlagsbuchhandlung. So, I mean, my impression is that this was just from a, you know, small bookstore, basically, a small uh, publisher. Um, there were a few reviews in, um, the, in the Jewish press. Um, they weren't particularly um, enlightening, rather than kind of articulating the sort of reception that one might might expect of the kind of like all these, you know, what a beautiful little photo book of all these all these cute children. There certainly wasn't, um, I mean, it's sort of taboo to critique these kinds of things, um, you know, particularly um, with, you know, these handsome children. So, um, you know, there, there isn't much in the way of a kind of, um, you know, critical literature on it, really, and really, the only only uh, critical scholarship on this that I know of is an article that appears in that big book on photo books, Autopsy, by Patrick Rösler, a German art historian, who's who talked about the book. But um, so, and and he may have some details in there about the print run. I just they escape me at the moment, but not big, certainly. Um, and um, in terms of its reception. Um, not particularly interesting. Dare I use another minor aesthetic category in my uh, description of it? I thought what was specifically going against the grain of much of the time. Yeah. Kind of muscular yeah, exactly. Sort of, it didn't put the controversial Sure. I mean, because it's a new. Actually, for face. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a niche publication, both in the sense that it's, uh, you know, in Germany, it's a Jewish photo book at a time when there aren't a lot of, you know, Jewish books or increasingly fewer Jewish books being published. So it's niche in that way. And then it's niche in that it's not just Jewish, it's Zionist. And then in that regard, it's, it's sort of further limited because it's not it's not relying on the kind of received iconist, uh, received Zionist iconography of, you know, sweaty, oily, working bodies. So um, a highly specialized publication for, for sure. Yeah. 